Welcome to the first ever Mystery Manicure Monologues, where I tell you a creepy story while showing you a nail art tutorial. All of the products I use will be listed in the description box. Sometimes the art will be 3D acrylic, and other times it will be hand-drawn nail art. If ever you have a suggestion for a story or nail art, please leave it in the comments down below. Disclaimer. I'm not a professional investigator, but have gathered this information for the sole purpose of entertainment. It is not my intention to mislead or change facts of the investigation, and I urge you to do your own research if ever you would like to know more about the mystery. The story contains gruesome details and sensitive subjects. Today's mystery is known in the media as the boy in the box. The boy in the box is an unidentified murder victim, a three to seven year old boy whose naked, battered body was found on the side of Susquehanna Road in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania on February 25, 1957. He appeared to have been cleaned and freshly groomed with a haircut and trimmed fingernails, although he had been severely beaten, bruised, and malnourished. The body was covered with scars some of which appeared to be surgical, most notably on his ankle, groin, and chin. It is believed that the cause of death was homicide by blunt force trauma. The boy remains unidentified as no one has ever come forward to claim him. For this reason, he is also known as America's unknown child and the case remains unsolved and is still to this day open. I'm sure as you will agree, as I keep going in this story, I can't imagine how this child was never identified. In February 1957, the boy's body wrapped in a plaid blanket was found in the woods off Susquehanna Road in Fox Chase, Philadelphia. The naked body was inside a cardboard box, which had once, ironically, contained a bassinet. The bassinet was sold by J.C. Penney. There was a barcode on the box that led it to the local J.C. Penney. The boy's hair had been recently cropped, possibly after death, as clumps of hair still clung to the body. There were signs of severe malnourishment as well as surgical scars on the ankle and groin and an L-shaped scar under the chin. I can't imagine how there were surgical scars on this child, but never a doctor or anyone to step forward, that's confused me with all of the research I've done. The body was first discovered by a young man who was apparently checking his muskrat traps. Fearing that the police would confiscate his traps, he did not report what he had found, if you can imagine. A few days later, a college student spotted a rabbit running into the underbrush. Knowing that there were animal traps in the area, he stopped his car to investigate and discovered the body. He was also reluctant to have any contact with the police, but he did report what he had found the following day after hearing about the disappearance of Mary Jane Barker. So Mary Jane Barker on February 25th, 1957 was an American four-year-old girl from Belmar, New Jersey, and she went missing along with her playmate's dog. After an extensive search throughout the city, dubbed by the press as the largest search in South Jersey, her dead body was discovered by her playmate in the closet of a vacant house near her home on March 3rd. The dog bounded out of the closet, seemingly unharmed. So despite the initial suspicion of foul play, the death was ruled as an accident, a case of starvation and exposure, as Barker was unable to escape the closet. Investigators concluded that Barker died on February 28th, three days after her disappearance. As a result, the mayor ordered closet doors to open more easily. So the press surrounding the Barker case also led to the first calls about the boy in the box. 
To me, the whole story about the guys checking on the muskrat traps and then another guy following a rabbit into the brush really seems quite odd, but I guess we're just gonna roll with it. I didn't have any more information than that on those two men. The police received the report and they opened an investigation on February 26, 1957. The dead boy's fingerprints were taken and the police at first were optimistic that he would soon be identified. However, no one ever came forward with any useful information. The case attracted massive media attention, as you can imagine, in Philadelphia and the Delaware Valley. The Philadelphia Inquirer printed 400,000 flyers depicting the boy's likeness, which were sent out and posted across the area. They were also included with every gas bill in Philadelphia, which is actually really smart. The crime scene was combed over and over again by 270 police academy recruits who discovered a man's blue corduroy cap that actually was investigated and really went nowhere, a child's scarf, and a man's white handkerchief with the letter G in the corner. All clues that led nowhere. The cap was actually investigated. It led to a lady that handmade the cap for a man that paid cash and she did not know who he was. The police also distributed a post-mortem photograph of the body fully dressed and in a seated position as he may have looked like in real life in the hope that it might lead to a clue. Despite the publicity and sporadic interest throughout the years, this boy's identity is still unknown and the case remains unsolved to this day. That being said, there is still interest in this case. On March 21st, 2016, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released a forensic facial reconstruction of the victim and added him to their database. So as you can imagine, many tips and theories have been advanced in the case, although most of them have been dismissed. Two theories have generated considerable interest among the police and the media, and myself, to be honest. They have each been extensively investigated. So there is a foster home theory. The theory concerns a foster home that was located approximately 2.5 kilometers from the site of the body. 2.5 kilometers is really not far. We're talking a 20 minute walk. In 1960, Remington Bristow, an employee of the medical examiner's office who pursued the case until his death in 1993, contacted a New Jersey psychic who told him to look for a house that matched exactly to the foster home. When the psychic was brought to Philadelphia Discovery Site, she led Bristow directly to the foster home. I think I believe her more than anyone else. Upon attending an estate sale that was happening at the foster home, Bristow discovered a bassinet similar to the one sold at J.C. Penney. Remember, that's where the box was that the boy was found in. He also discovered blankets hanging on a clothesline that were very similar to the one in which the boy's body had been wrapped in when they discovered him. Bristow believed that the boy belonged to the stepdaughter, now follow me here, to the stepdaughter of the man who ran the foster home and that they disposed of his body so the stepdaughter would not be exposed as an unwed mother. Now, to me, that was the least of her worries. Baristo theorized that the boy's death had been an accident. Despite the circumstantial evidence, the police were not able to find many definite links between the boy in the box and the foster family. In 1998, Philadelphia Police Lieutenant Tom Augustine, who was in charge of the investigation, and several members of the Vidoc Society interviewed the foster father and the stepdaughter, get this, whom he had married. 
the foster home investigation was closed. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that deserved a little bit more investigation. So the Vidoc Society that I had mentioned is a members only crime solving club in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. It is named for Eugene Francis Vidoc, the groundbreaking 19th century French detective who helped police by using the psychology of the criminal to solve a cold case homicide. Vidoc was a formal former criminal himself, and he used his knowledge of the criminal mind to look at murder from a psychological perspective of the perpetrator. At meetings, law enforcement officials from around the world present cold cases for review. Members are forensic professionals, current and former FBI profilers, homicide investigators, scientists, psychologists, prosecutors, and coroners, who use their gathered experience to provide new insights for investigations that have gone cold. Membership is capped at 82, which is one for each year at Vidoc's life. The society was formed in 1990 by William Flesher, Richard Walter, and Frank Bender. It solved its first case in 1991, clearing an innocent man of involvement in the murder of Huey Cox in Little Rock, Arkansas. In addition to the Boy in the Box investigation, the Society was involved in solving the murder of Terry Brooks. Some law enforcement agencies doubt the FC of their work. I don't know. I think these guys are doing good things. Now, this wasn't the only theory. Another theory was brought forward in February of 2002 by a woman identified only as Martha. Police considered Martha's story to be plausible, but were troubled by her testimony as she had a history of mental illness. Now, I couldn't find anything that told me what Martha's mental illness may have been. So M, as they call her, claimed that her abusive mother had purchased the unknown boy, who she claimed his name was Jonathan, from his birth parents in the summer of 1954. Subsequently, the boy was subjected to extreme physical and sexual abuse for two and a half years. One evening at dinner, the boy vomited up his meal of baked beans and was given a severe beating, with his head being slammed against the floor until he was semi-conscious. He was then given a bath, during which he died. These details matched information known only to the police as the coroner had found that the boy's stomach contained remains of baked beans and that his fingers were water wrinkled. The thing I don't understand about this is why do you beat a boy senseless and then care enough to give him a bath? But maybe that's just something I don't understand. So M's mother cut the boy's distinctive long hair, accounting for the unprofessional haircut which police noted in their initial investigation, in an effort to conceal his identity. M's mother forced M to assist in the dumping of the boy's body in the Fox Chase area. M then said that as they were preparing to move the boy's body from the trunk of the car, a passing male motorist pulled up alongside to inquire if they needed any help. M was ordered to stand in front of the car's license plate to shield it from view, while the mother convinced a would-be Good Samaritan that there was no problem. The man eventually drove off. This story actually did corroborate the confidential testimony given by the male witness in 57, who said that the body had been placed in a box, previously discarded at the scene. In spite of the outward plausibility of M's confession, the police were unable to verify her story. Neighbors who had access to M's house during the stated time period denied that there had been a young boy living there and dismissed, dismissed M's claims as ridiculous. I don't know. I think there was more to this story, but I also think there was way more to the foster home story. So forensic artist Frank Bender, who you may remember his name with the Vidoc Society, Frank or Francis Bender was an 
forensic artist and fine artist. He made facial reconstructions of the dead based on their skeletons and of fugitives based on outdated photographs. He developed a theory that the victim may have been raised as a girl. The child's unprofessional haircut, which appeared to have been performed in haste, was the basis for the scenario, as well as the appearance of the eyebrows having been styled. In 2008, Bender released a sketch of the unidentified child with longer hair, reflecting the strands found on the body. As for where the boy is now, the boy in the box was originally buried in a potter's field in 1998, his body was exhumed for the purpose of distracting some DNA, which was obtained from enamel off of a tooth. He was reburied at Ivy Hill Cemetery in Cedarbrook, Philadelphia, which donated a large plot. The coffin, headstone, and funeral service were donated by the son of a man who had buried the boy in 1957. There was significant public attendance and media coverage, of course, at the reburial. The grave has a large headstone bearing the words, America's Unknown Child. City resident, residents keep the grave decorated with flowers and stuffed animals. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of my story today. If you have any suggestions for stories or nail art, please pop them down below. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe to this new channel.